Eric Hayden and Urban Catalyst, I, I, I believe, have been on every single one of my OZ Pitch Day events. Uh, and they're the title partner this time around as well. So Eric, as always, thank you. And and thanks to Urban Catalyst for your support of Opportunity DB and OZ Pitch Day. How are you doing this morning? You're doing great, Jimmy. And it's always a pleasure to be here with you. We really like your presentation. Awesome. Well, Eric, you're our title partner for today's event, as I mentioned. Eric, without further ado, why don't you please dive in? Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jamie. So our current offering here at Urban Catalyst is Urban Catalyst Opportunity Zone Fund 2. Uh, this fund is structured a lot like a traditional real estate equity fund. We're focused on doing ground up real estate development in downtown San Jose, California. And of course, as an Opportunity Zone Fund, we're able to give those tax benefits to our investors. Uh, just to kick us off, you know, Urban Catalyst, we've been featured pretty prominently in the news over the last few years. Uh, this is our second Opportunity Zone fund in downtown San Jose. So really, we've had a lot of newspaper articles written about us, really just a lot of positive buzz about what we're doing here in downtown San Jose. Uh, probably most important of those, we were named by Forbes magazine as one of the top 20 Opportunity Zone funds in the country. So nothing like getting a little, you know, national validation from Forbes that we're doing things the right way. A little bit about the program, and I'm sure everybody um, understands the basics of the program, but it never hurts to go over it just a little bit. In order to get the tax benefits associated with Opportunity Zone Fund investment, investors have to invest capital gains. Uh, here are the three most common ways that folks have capital gains events. And then, of course, you have 180 days from the date you have that capital gains event to invest into a qualified Opportunity Zone fund. You know, we don't want anyone to miss out on the timeline, so we make sure that folks are aware of it. There are two major tax benefits associated with the program. The first is investors are able to defer paying capital gains taxes until they pay their taxes in 2027. So that means uh, your initial capital gains event, you don't have to pay taxes this year. You don't have to pay them until 2027. Um, second benefit is really the major benefit, right? And that is there are no taxes after no taxes on profits after an investor's funds really have been in our fund for over 10 years. So investors invest 10 years later. Uh, we plan on selling all of the assets in this fund, really just liquidating the fund. And that's when we plan on returning the majority of the profits to our investors. And again, those uh, profits are tax free from a federal capital gains perspective. So two great benefits. And one other thing to mention on this slide is uh, there is some pending legislation, both the House and the Senate about Opportunity Zone funds would extend everyone uh, from 2027 to 2029. So they wouldn't have to pay uh, capital gains tax on that initial capital gains event until 2020, until 2029. But, uh, you know, we don't like to speculate on when that legislation may pass, but we did want to make folks aware of it. There could be some good news out there on the horizon. Just taking a step back here, are the opportunity zones throughout the Bay Area. You can see them in green. Uh, for this fund, obviously, we're focused, as I mentioned, on San Jose and even more specifically downtown San Jose. You can see four opportunity zones cover almost all of downtown. You know, here at Urban Catalyst, we've been developers uh, doing business in and around the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, downtown San Jose for many years. And really, downtown San Jose has everything that we want to see uh, whenever we do development anywhere. Um, the first thing we want to see is we want to make sure that there's demand for all the different types of projects that we're building. Uh, that demand here is really generated by the Silicon Valley job engine. We also want to make sure that transit and physical infrastructure are already in place. You know, downtown San Jose is really the only true urban environment in Silicon Valley. Uh, we have great things like the Deardon train station, one of the largest train stations uh, in the United States. It is the largest train station on the West Coast. Uh, has a variety of mass transit options that connect to it, including Caltrain, which gets you, you know, up to San Francisco in about an hour, and BART, which is the largest mass transportation system here in the Bay Area. BART is now fully funded to connect through downtown San Jose into Deardon Station. It's only taken them, you know, 65 years from BART's inception to connect to San Jose, but we're happy that it's on its way. Uh, San Jose State University with you know, over 36,000 students is the second largest university in the Bay Area behind Cal Berkeley, and it's right in the heart of downtown. And then the last thing that we want to see is we want to make sure that the local government really wants to see development happen. 
you know, most Bay Area cities are pretty anti-development. Um, it's kind of a sad story, right? Especially with the housing crisis that we have in California. But uh, here in downtown San Jose, it's kind of the opposite. This is where they want to see high density development. Uh, this is where they want to you know, make things happen next to all that transit and physical infrastructure that's in place. Uh, this is a picture of my partner, my partner, Josh, and I with Matt Mahan. He's the mayor of San Jose. Really, a lot of the policies he's put into place have streamlined the pre-construction process, just making it so much easier for developers like us to do business. So we're very happy to be doing business in downtown San Jose. Just to give everyone an idea of you know, what is happening here in downtown San Jose, I like to show this before and after slide. So here's the current skyline in San Jose. Um, if all of the projects that are currently in the planning process are built out, say over the next 10 years or so, downtown San Jose should almost triple in size. So quite a bit of development plan for downtown. Um, you can see urban catalyst projects, uh, both our fund one and fund two projects there in red. To continue talking about the local market here in downtown San Jose, I wanted to show you this two dimensional map. Uh, this black line, this represents the opportunity zone. Uh, our headquarters is right here. And I like to point that out because you know we're located right in the heart of the zone. Uh, we're within walking distance of all of our projects. So we're very uh, familiar with you know, really what is happening in downtown. We're also right next door to Adobe's world headquarters. Um, Adobe has been building their fourth tower right here for the last three years. They just completed it at the end of last year and they moved 3000 employees in in January. Uh, it really is a beautiful building. It's been fun to watch it you know, start from nothing, and then suddenly it's one of the largest high-rises in downtown. Uh, we're also right next door to Zoom, and kind of, uh, uh, kind of a funny story. You know, We share a parking garage with Zoom, and now Zoom is back in the office, and all of my employees are complaining there's nowhere to park. We always kind of thought if anyone was going to work from home forever, it would definitely be Zoom, but uh, Zoom is now back in the office. Here's San Jose State University. Um, this red dash line, this is where that new BART line is running underneath Santa Clara Street with a station here in downtown, and then connecting into Deardon Station, that big train station. Kind of the, call it the biggest story here in downtown San Jose over the last few years has been Google's massive acquisitions. And I'll give everyone a little bit of a, a recap of what they've been up to, but as you can see, they've, they've acquired quite a bit of property, over 80 acres of property. They spent about a half a billion dollars acquiring property. Uh, they had their plans approved a couple of years ago, uh, and those plans show them building around 7 million square feet of office and 6,000 residential units. Uh, at Build Out, this will be Google's largest campus on Earth. Uh, this is their third major campus in Silicon Valley. Uh, Google says this is a 10 plus year build out. It'll be a $19 billion build out. It, they're estimating it'll bring an additional 40,000 people to downtown San Jose every day. Uh, Google started construction on this project last December uh, on their first phase. So that's what Google's been up to. Um, but of course, Google's not the only thing that's been going on. Other developers have really flooded into downtown San Jose over the last few years. You know, they saw the opportunity uh, that downtown San Jose really has presented. And so we see, you know, examples like Boston Properties, you know, big publicly traded REIT has come in in a big way. Uh, West Bank, who's an international development group out of Toronto, uh, Heinz, the largest uh, development company in the country, is in downtown right here. And then Jay Paul, who's a regional developer, but just finished building you know, 26 buildings in the city of Sunnyvale, has come into downtown in a big way as well. Um, here's some of the projects those folks are building, just to kind of show some of the you know, excitement happening in downtown San Jose. Here's Adobe's new tower. It really, as I mentioned, is a good looking project. A Miro tower is just finished. This is two uh, apartment buildings right next door to each other, a total of 630 units. Uh, that's a real success story in downtown. It's leasing up at the highest rents in the city at around 35 units a month. They're about 85% occupied right now. And the reason why that one's really important is because here in Fund 2, we have two apartment projects right across the street from there. So it's always nice to have your best comparable uh, right next door. Uh, other great ones, you know, Platform 16 is with Boston Properties is under construction on uh, this project was recently completed. So yeah, a lot, of, uh, a lot of excitement happening in downtown. And here at Urban Catalyst, you know, we saw this wave of development coming. Our whole plan was to 
you know, really get in on the ground floor and acquire properties before they were scooped up by all the other developers and big tech companies. And uh, that's exactly what we did with the acquisition of our fund one and fund two projects. Uh, you can see fund one projects here in blue, fund two projects in orange. So there are four projects in fund two. We have these two projects right here, which are apartment projects. Again, that's right next door to that Miro Towers, which is located right here. It's also right next to City Hall and it's right on Santa Clara Street, you know, Santa Clara Street, kind of the main drag of the central business district. And of course, where BART is going to be running, you can see that new BART station is going to be right next door to us, uh, really making this project the epitome of transit oriented development. Then, you know, as we cross over the 87 freeway where Google is, we call this Downtown West. Uh, we have two projects in Downtown West right here. Uh, this is a hotel project. This is a senior living facility. Uh, I'm really familiar with doing development uh, on this street over here in Downtown West because I've built around 800 apartment units on this street. So, uh, yeah, a lot of success building in Downtown West. We did continue that here in this fund. Um, here's what our four projects look like. So as I mentioned, we have a hotel project, senior living facility, apartment project. This is an office and I'm gonna kind of spoil it. We're changing this office uh, to multifamily here very shortly. We're about to uh, resubmit applications to the city as office really has taken a pretty significant downturn uh, over the last year to year and a half. And we no longer wanna have uh, exposure to office in this fund. Uh, I'm gonna go through each of these projects individually and talk about them in a little bit more detail. First project, the Keystone Hotel. We really like this project. Um, it's a Marriott Town Place Suites. That's an extended stay business hotel. Uh, Marriott's been wanting to put this extended stay product into the downtown area for almost a decade. Uh, we partnered with Marriott in 2019 uh, to create this project. They chose us because we had one of the best projects. And of course, we're one of the you know, reputable developers here in downtown San Jose. Uh, this project's 176 keys. You know, our average guest stays for 15 nights. Every room has its own kitchen. You know, hotels took a pretty significant hit during COVID. Uh, they bounced back pretty quickly. And business hotels have now gotten back to really pre-COVID levels. Uh, they've struggled a little bit in the last couple of months. But uh, this project isn't anticipated to be complete until next year. But the good news for this project is we did start construction on it this year. Uh, we ripped down all the buildings on the site and now we're doing vertical construction. Uh, in this presentation, I have to update this slide every month because another floor seems to go up, it's going so fast. Um, we, this building is an eight story building, it's three floors of concrete at the base with five floors of wood frame construction on top. It's a very common construction type here in California uh, since 2017, when they changed the building code, it's really how you maximize density within the building envelope of an eight story building. Uh, right now we're working on the fifth floor of wood framing. Right across the street from that, also again in downtown West, right next to that Google massive campus is Gifford Place. Gifford Place, this is our senior living facility. It's 169 units of assisted living and memory care. Uh, also, very similar to the hotel project, they haven't built uh, any product like this in downtown San Jose in over 40 years. So it's uh, a lot of demand for this type of project. And then San Jose and the San Jose metro area, you know, on any given year, we're, we're rated the number one market in America for senior living. And that's really for two major reasons. The first is uh, we have income levels uh, in the San Jose metro area and really the Silicon Valley area. Uh, we have income levels where folks can afford to put their parents and grandparents into facilities like this. Uh, the second is we do have an aging population. You know, a lot of people call it the gray wave. It is good for us to get out ahead of that with uh, creating new supply as you know, one of the biggest problems uh, throughout Silicon Valley is our inability to build new ground up development projects because of government restrictions and really constraints uh, the constraints of mountains and water surrounding all of our metropolitan areas. We can't build outward. So uh, again, really like this project. This project is shovel ready. So uh, all of our projects, we own all of the land. We have all of the approvals to build all of these buildings. This project is a little bit more advanced as it's ready to start construction. Um, we don't anticipate starting construction on this project until the end of next year, mainly due to uh, financing markets not giving us favorable terms. 
Uh, we do expect that to change over the next 12 months or so. And this is just a really great project uh, waiting to start. Uh, we did break ground on this project and knock down all the buildings last year. Uh, we're currently using the land as construction staging for our hotel project across the street. All right, back to the downtown core. Uh, our two projects here, Icon and Echo. This is Echo, so Echo's right here. Uh, this is a 388-unit apartment project. Remember that uh, Miro Towers I was talking about? That's right here. So this project, Echo, you know, we're really big fans of this project, especially. I mean, multifamily has been kind of a no-brainer here uh, in Silicon Valley for you know 20 years. And that's because we have, as I mentioned, a pretty significant housing crisis in California. It's even more exacerbated here in Silicon Valley because, well, we've created six jobs for every housing unit uh, for over 30 years straight. And that has driven our pricing to some of the highest in the world. Um, the single family home price here in uh, San Jose hit a new record last year, clocking in at 1.7 million for the average home. Um, that makes us the most expensive big city to live in in America and the fourth most expensive city to live in in the entire world. Uh, our apartment rents are the third most expensive in the country behind San Francisco and New York. So you kind of get a feeling of uh, you know, just how dire it is that all these tech folks have somewhere to live. So creating housing is a good solution for that. Um, you know, when we have this lack of supply and just so much demand, we get things like the highest occupancy rates in the country. Uh, from May to May of last year, we had the highest rental growth of anywhere else in the country. And a lot of third parties are suggesting that apartment rents are going to continue to increase here in Silicon Valley over the next five and 10 years, really at a faster pace than almost anywhere else in the country. Uh, not, uh, not a surprise to us here as we've seen this happen, you know, for over a decade, but uh, we do, we do uh, like to see a lot of folks saying things like that. Finally, our final project, ICON. So ICON is an office building, fully approved, 500,000 square feet, just a beautiful building. It's just a shame that the office market has just completely collapsed. Uh, we've seen, of course, return to office really not come off here in the Bay Area in a big way. So we don't have a lot of tenants. There is no financing. So for our fund investors, we did decide that it would be better uh, returns to convert this project to multifamily. So we are changing this to a uh, two tower, 650 unit multifamily apartment building. So we'll have just over a thousand units on this block. Uh, it's a perfect place, as I mentioned, to build multifamily, lots of demand for multifamily, lots of financing for multifamily. So uh, multifamily is our switch. It'll take us about a year to go back through the planning process to get our approvals. Uh, usually not much of a big deal here in downtown San Jose. We've already had a lot of conversations with the city about this change. Uh, we're gonna formally make this announcement um, in about a week and a half. Um, so those are our four projects. You know, I wanna talk a little bit about Urban Catalyst and who we are. You know, I mentioned we've done lots of development. Uh, so I'm the founder and CEO of Urban Catalyst. I've done several billion dollars worth of projects throughout my you know 20 plus year career. In general, I build institutional and quality scale projects. And that really means I build big income producing buildings with a you know, typical exit strategy of selling to a publicly traded REIT or a large institutional investment group. We have five partners here at Urban Catalyst. We also have around 40 people that work at Urban Catalyst now. Uh, my two development partners are Josh and Paul. I've known these guys for you know 15 plus years, Josh. He's our chief operating officer. He has significant development experience all throughout the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, uh, a lot of emphasis in San Jose, and he's built a variety of different asset classes, kind of mirroring what we're building here uh, in Urban Catalyst Fund 2. Uh, Paul Ring, very similar. He has uh, a lot of experience building multifamily and below market rate housing. Uh, almost 25 years of experience doing that, uh, almost exclusively here in downtown San Jose. Uh, I, in the past, have worked, you know, prior to forming Urban Catalyst, I worked as a joint venture partner with both of them on several projects. So I already knew that they were two of the best developers in downtown. So when I formed Urban Catalyst, brought them on as my partners. Uh, so yes, Josh, our chief operating officer, Paul is our executive vice president of development and construction. Paul manages our 18-person team of development and construction professionals that build all of our buildings. 
we actually just had our development retreat uh, last night and yesterday. And uh, it's always good to check in annually and set our goals for the next year. We got Morgan Mackles. Morgan is a really close friend of mine. I've known him for over 25 years. He and I went to high school together. We, uh, well, he was a groomsman at my wedding. Morgan runs investor relations for us. And what he does is he does our fundraising. He's the reason we've been so successful in our fundraising for the variety of funds that we have here on the Urban Catalyst platform. You know, overall, we have over 800 investors. We've raised over $350 million. So uh, we've been doing pretty well in the fundraising category for our projects here in San Jose. And then finally, Sean Raft, who's our chief administrative officer and general counsel. You know, Sean, of course, he's an attorney, manages all of our legal teams. He also manages our fund administrators. Uh, all of the administration is associated with, uh, you know, running our funds, all of our compliance with the opportunity zone rules and regulations with the SEC. You know, Sean, easy way to say it, he really dots the I's and crosses the T's here at Urban Catalyst. So these are the five partners, you know, combined here in Silicon Valley, we've done over $5 billion worth of ground up development projects. And you can see the heavy concentration of projects in downtown San Jose. Been doing this a long time around here. We've been very successful at it. Plan to continue that success here at Urban Catalyst. All right, now for the fun part, this is our project timeline. You know, every Opportunity Zone fund is a little bit different. So we do want to go through this with everyone to kind of let you know how we plan to roll out this fund. Um, it's a $200 million fundraise. We've been fundraising for almost three years now. Uh, we're at about 140 million. We do plan on extending our fundraise for 12 months. Um, making that fundraise close at the end of 2024. So if you do plan on having capital gains events next year, be sure to look us up. Also, just, you know, we flagged 2027. That's the year everybody has to pay taxes on that initial capital gains event. Of course, I mentioned we're hoping that pushes out to 2029. That'd be great. Um, here in 2034, and what looks like we pushed to 2035, that's when we plan on selling our properties. Uh, that gives that 10 years to tax-free profits. So, uh, 10 years, kind of a long time to wait to see returns. We do plan on starting making returns sooner than that with refinance events. Uh, these refinance events, pretty typical for ground development as you know, we build these buildings, we use construction loans. When we lease them up and stabilize them after they're built, you know, we go out and we get permanent financing to take out those construction loans. And typically the permanent financing is a larger amount. We take that permanent financing, we pay off the construction loan, and excess refinance proceeds, we can use those to make distributions to our investors. Those distributions are tax-free because they're distribution of debt, kind of like a kind of like a home equity line of credit. Um, we plan on having our first refinance event in 2026. That's when uh, our hotel project will be complete and stabilized and refinanced. Uh, other projects will push out probably out through 2030, 2031 as we. Uh, stagger the starts of some of those multifamilies and phases and have those refinance events. We'll also plan on distributing cash flow to our investors. This is cash flow from our stabilized assets. You know, we'll have net operating income coming off these assets. We'll pay our debt service. And then after that, we'll have excess cash flow. Um, as that cash flow builds up, we do plan on making distributions to our investors. Now, one of the interesting things about this is, and this program in general, is for funds like us that are structured as an LLC. Uh, of course, we give our investors K-1s every year. We plan on passing through a pretty significant amount of passive loss. A lot of our passive losses that investors will see on their K-1s come from the depreciation of our stabilized assets. Uh, that depreciation, you know, it's, it's something that everybody that owns property typically takes on their tax returns. Uh, same for us, only we pass it through to our investors as passive losses on their K-1. Now, why that's nice is because this cash flow is passive income. We're passing through passive losses. In some cases, the passive losses will be able to offset this cash flow, making this cash flow tax free. Uh, we plan on having more passive losses than cash flow throughout the duration of the fund, which is really nice. Then here at the end, you know, when we sell the properties, um, one of the unique benefits for the Opportunity Zone program is, you know, typically when you sell a real estate asset, you have to pay back. All that depreciation you've taken, you, know, you sold it for more than you bought it for. And the government says, wait a minute, you can't just keep all that depreciation. You need to pay that back. Your property didn't go down in value. So that's called depreciation recapture. And everybody, well, no one's really a fan of depreciation recapture. 
Nice part about opportunity zone funds, there is no depreciation recapture. So we're gonna pass you through as much passive loss from depreciation as humanly possible. Uh, and then at the end, when we sell those assets, you get to keep all of those passive losses. And of course, when we sell the properties, that's when we get the tax-free profits because of the Opportunity Zone program. So kind of a recap is tax-free refinance events, possibility of tax-free cash flow, and then tax-free profits after 10 years when we sell the asset. So overall, it's a pretty good program uh, from a tax perspective that uh, the government has structured for us to operate with. Finally, the last thing I want to talk about is our bonus units program. This has been a really popular program. Um, here at Urban Catalyst, throughout a variety of funds. Uh, we have bonus units in most of our funds. And the way that this works is, you know, if you invest in Urban Catalyst, what you're doing is you're buying our units. You're then paid out based upon the number of units that you own. So we give bonus units in three different ways. We'll start at the time incentive credit. This is really to reward investors for earlier investment. We're here in November, 0.25% bonus units. You see it goes down in December. Uh, that means that if you bought $100 worth of our units this month, you get $100.25 worth of our units. It is more than likely if we extend uh, the fundraise for an additional year, we're going to add 2.75% bonus units to everyone's bonus units. So we'll have this schedule for next year. And investors that invest in November, for example, would then get around 3% bonus units. That hasn't been uh, fully announced yet, but it will be here in the next week or so. So stay tuned. Uh, multiple ventures program. This is for investors who are previous investors with us in our other funds. Uh, they get four and a half percent bonus units when they invest in Urban Catalyst. And finally, our volume incentive program. This is to reward investors for more investment. Our minimum investment size, 250,000. Bonus units start at 1% at 300,000. They go all the way up to 9% at 1.9 million. These three categories add together to get your total amount of bonus units. Well, Jimmy, that's the um, that's the end of my presentation. Thought we could open it up. I saw we got some questions. Yeah, we've got a ton of questions, and we've got uh, time for a few of them. Eric, first question is: uh, I love the Urban Catalyst vision and project. Can you tell us more about how, if any, you have evolved the fund or project since the new era of higher interest rates and less demand for office? This question came in at the very start of your presentation, I think, Eric. So before you announced that uh, you were converting that that one building from office back into multifamily, but do you have anything else to to add to yeah, that? Yeah, a couple of a couple of things that we've done over the last couple of years. The first is when we first launched Opportunity Zone Fund 2, it was just Icon and Echo. At the beginning of 2023, we did add Keystone and Gifford. Uh, those are projects that are currently in our fund one, where fund two will be coming in as the third party equity provider for those projects. We did that because we wanted to get uh, we wanted to get fund two equity to work building projects as soon as possible, and we wanted to diversify out of office. At that time, we weren't really at the position where we were ready to scrap the office altogether and go with multifamily. Uh, but I did mention during my presentation, we did that with uh, that office project. We also, uh, separate from our Opportunity Zone Fund, we have launched a new fund that is specifically for one of our Fund 1 projects to provide that third-party equity. As third-party equity and debt has been um, very challenging for ground-up developers to get, of course, all over the country, uh, really since uh, interest rates started rising in mid-2022. Good. Uh, let's see. I don't know if this question is for you specifically, Eric, or if you know the answer to it, but... Uh... Somebody anonymously asked, are there any differences in reporting docs for a typical 10-year private equity fund versus a 10-year OZ fund? Well, um, OZ funds have their own reporting requirements in order to qualify as an opportunity zone fund. You have to uh, submit that you know, working capital plan and you know, show that you're qualifying as an opportunity zone fund every six months. Uh, other private equity funds don't have to do that. Uh, the SEC filings are pretty similar to other private equity. Uh, Bill asked this question about 20 minutes ago. I'm not quite sure who he's referring to here, but he asked, aren't they cutting back on some of their properties? Maybe he's referring to you or Google. I'm not really sure there. Yeah, he's probably referring to Google. Uh, there was an article that came out about Google, uh, I don't know, maybe six months ago. What Google had done is they started construction on their first phase last year, and they had a scope of work of demolition and some historic remediation, You know, kind of getting their properties ready for development. And they finished that scope of work and right when that happened, a bunch of national news articles came out and said, Google halts construction, which 
this is really kind of the farthest thing from the truth. Uh, in reality, Google was successful in processing their project way faster than they thought they were going to be processing. We just talked with the uh, head of development over at Google two weeks ago because we get this question a lot. Uh, he's like, yeah, uh, we thought this project was going to take us like six years to get through the city and then we were going to get sued and have to fight those lawsuits. And instead, it just took us two years and everything was approved and we were just shocked. He says, so we're not halting. We're actually just kind of... Uh, trying to move forward and we're going a little faster than we thought we'd be going. So that's really what's going on with Google. They're still fully committed to downtown San Jose. And as I mentioned, they keep saying 10 plus years, $19 billion, you know, we're working on it. Yep. Yeah, it's going to take a little while, but they're working on it. Uh, Alan asks, uh, parking for your properties, question mark? What do, what do you got parking wise for your properties, Eric? Uh, all four properties in fund two have built in parking into the buildings and that is something that we like to do for all of our market rate buildings because people need a place to park. Good. Uh, Diane has a couple of questions here. She seems to be concerned about some delays. She says, with new development at groundbreaking stage and not yet built, where does completion come as compared to the three-year time limit for QOZ investment, especially considering changing one property from office to residential and probable delay? So I think she's uh, speaking to some of the regulations around how quickly the QOF has to deploy capital into the properties. Maybe you can speak to that issue for a minute. Sure. So as far as all the rules and regulations of opportunity zones and how they're structured, we meet all of those. And we're not up against any like three-year you know, issues because really we've deployed most of our funds already in order to acquire the land and process the project through entitlements. Um, I, I think that answers the question, Jimmy. Uh, we do have some delays associated with starting our projects, mainly because of constraints in the financing market since interest rates have gone up. Uh, COVID also really didn't help us a whole lot. But, um, you know, our big value add here at Urban Catalyst is when we build these buildings, it is a 10-year fund. We do have a long time to build them. Very good. Well, Eric, with that, we're at time for your main presentation here in the main session. So, Eric, with that, thank you to you personally and to... Urban Catalyst for being our title partner on today's event.